wonder how a test prep expert tackles a GRE question? Not with the intention to instruct, but like a test taker, trying to get the answer as efficiently as possible while the time is bleeding off the clock. Today, I'm going to do just that. My name is Lene. I'm a test prep expert here at Magoosh. I'm going to solve some of the questions from our free diagnostic test in real time, revealing the way that I approach the question and arrive at the solution. One quick note, the purpose of this video is to give you a preview of the diagnostic test we offer. Therefore, I'm not going to break down how to solve these questions in a step-by-step -step fashion. If you are interested in a step-by-step -step approach, as well as any applicable strategies and techniques, you can try out the free GRE practice test with the link provided in the description. With that link, you can opt for the shorter diagnostic or the full length practice test. Both versions are free and both are great ways to kickstart your GRE preparation journey. And if you feel like you wanna solve any of the questions on the screen before I select an answer choice, you should feel free to pause the video at any point in order to do so. All right, let's get to it. All right, here we go. You can see I've leveled up the seriousness because I've got my ear cans on and <sighs> scratch paper is ready to go. When you sit down and you're ready to do this, you're going to see this math section screen. 21 minutes to answer 12 questions. We're not gonna do all 12 questions. We're gonna do a few questions just to give you an idea of how I would attack this and also what it looks like when you're ready to attack it. Let's begin. Okay, our first question is a quantitative comparison. We've got W, X, and Y are positive integers. W plus X plus Y equals 90. In column A, the average arithmetic mean of W, X, and Y, and in column B, the median of W, X, and Y. So here's the nice thing about this question. Already, I've got a lot to work with. So I've been given the total, 90. So I know that the sum of W, X plus Y is 90, and I also know how to determine the average because I determine the average by dividing the total by the number of things. The number of things here is three, the total is 90. So that's gonna give me an average of 30, which means I already know column A is 30. Now column B is the median of W, X, and Y, and I can assign whatever values I want. So really I'm just trying to prove that column A is greater or column B is greater or they're equal or an answer can't be determined because I get different answers. So if I say that, well, W, X, and Y, they're all 30, 30, 30, and 30, then I've proven that they are equal. But I can easily say, well, how about another case in which I've got W is one, X is 1 and Y is 88. Well, now I've shown that column A, which is 30, is greater than column B, and I've done enough work to know that the relationship cannot be determined from the information given because I get different answers. Sometimes they're equal, sometimes A is greater. I could even make B greater. Don't need to. All right. Moving on to the next one. We have another quantitative comparison. Okay, so in this quantitative comparison, we have values but they all live in the negative zone. So already I'm thinking, okay, well, what can I use from this problem? P is less than Q, less than negative one, and they are greater than negative two. In column A, I've got a negative in front of that parentheses. So that's going to change the way I think about this problem. Parentheses including P plus Q. Over in column B, I've got one. So if both A and B are less than negative one, if I add those inequalities together, then I would have P and Q, or P plus Q, is less than negative two. Okay, but this is where that negative over there is coming into play for this quantitative comparison. So I can solve this. If I'm gonna negate this inequality, that means that I'm going to multiply both sides by negative one. And if I multiply both sides by negative one, then that's gonna flip the sign. So what I end up with over in column A is P plus Q is greater than two. So I know for sure that it's gonna beat column B. So the algebra that I did or the manipulation that I did in rearranging the values tells me that quantity A, or the quantity in column A is greater. I'm confident about that. Another way I could have approached this, if I wasn't confident about manipulating, I could have plugged in values to test it. But I think that manipulating 
was the more efficient way to solve this one. Okay, moving on to question three. Okay, we got another quantitative comparison. In this one, W, X, and Y cannot equal zero. Okay, so one of those, none of those values can be zero. Then I'm given three W equals four X and four Y equals three X. In column A, I'm looking for the ratio of W to Y and in column B, I'm comparing that to one. So I'm gonna do a little bit of work on this one. First of all, I've got that three W equals four X and four Y equals three X. So I'm gonna rearrange that first value and I'm gonna say, okay, well, I want to isolate the X. So then I'm gonna divide both sides by four. So now I've got three W over four equals X. And now that I have a value for X, I'm gonna substitute that into that second equation. So four Y equals three times X, but now that I have new value for X, I've got four Y equals three times what I'm substituting in, which is three W over four. I wanna get rid of that three. So I'm gonna multiply, well actually I wanna get rid, I'm gonna distribute three. So this becomes nine W over four. That's the step I wanna do here. And now that I've got nine W over four, I'm gonna multiply both sides by four to clear out the fraction. Fraction is now out of there and I've got 16 Y equals nine W. Gonna divide by Y so I can get the Y over on the side that I want it to be on. So if I divide by Y, I've got 16 equals nine W over Y. And now I wanna isolate W over Y because that's really what I'm looking for in column A. So to do so, I'm gonna divide both sides by nine. Dividing both sides by nine, I've got 16 over nine equals W over Y. I now have the ratio. So W over Y or the ratio of W to Y is 16 over nine. That is greater than one. So I'm gonna pick A for this as well and get to getting. Next up, we have inequalities and in quantitative comparisons. How fun. So right now we've got 10. Well, actually we have limitations. A can be between 10 and 12 and B can be between four and five. Okay, so in column A, I have A squared over B, and in column B, I have 32. Kind of nice when I just have a solid value. We've seen that for the last three questions. That's a good thing. So now I just don't really have to worry about manipulating column B. It's a value and I can just work with that. But I do have to think about, well, the variability of column A. So if I wanna test the lower limit of column A, I need to make the fraction small. So for a small fraction, I'm gonna need the largest possible numerator and a small denominator. So for a large numerator and a small denominator, or how I'm gonna start this is I'm gonna start with 10 squared, that's my lowest value for A, over my largest value for B. So I'm gonna go with 10 squared over five, and that gives me 100 over five. So now I know the lower limit value for column A is going to be 20. So the lower end of my range is 20, but now I got to figure out the upper limit of the range I've been given. So with that, I'm going to switch and I'm going to go with the largest value for A. So A I know has to be less than 12. So that means that I can go ahead and throw in 12 squared for column A and then put it over my smallest B. B has to be bigger than four, but I'm going to use I, of course I'm going to use four to test this out. So then with that scenario, I've got 144 over four, and that's gonna be 36. So now I know that for column A, I the range of the values of A squared over B, it's gotta be larger than 20, but less than 36, or larger than 20 and less than 36, which means it could be greater than or lesser than 32, because 32 is within that range. It's larger than some of the values, it's smaller than some of the others. So because I could have a bigger value than 32 and a smaller value than 32, the relationship cannot be determined on this one because I can get different answers. Okay, plugging right along to our next question. In that corporation, which we are never gonna bother to try to pronounce, no one needs to do that. On the test, don't do that. Just the, the O corporation. 60% of the total revenue R is devoted to the advertising budget. Five six of this advertising budget was spent on television advertising, which of the following represents the dollar amount spent on television advertising. Okay, so this is asking me for 
or asking me to take percents and fractions off of an unknown total. And I have variables in the answer choice. So I'm immediately thinking I'm going to plug in something to make this easy for myself. I'm going to say that the total revenue R is 100. So that's my total revenue. And now I'm just going to use that to walk through this problem. 60% of the total revenue, I've made that easy. That's just going to be $60. So that is the ad budget. And then five sixths of the ad budget, which is five sixths of 60, that's going to be a lot of two television advertisements. Uh, so five six of 60, that's 50. So 50 is gonna go to television and that's what I'm solving for, which the following represents the dollar amount spent on television advertising, $50. I'm gonna go to the answer choices. Remember I set R equal to 100. So now I can just go through this. A is looking pretty good. That's 100 divided by two. That's most definitely 50. But because I used this technique of plugging in values, I just gotta quickly check the rest of them. B is 100 over three, not 50. C, that's 200 over three, not 50. Then I've got 200 divided by five and 400 divided by five. Neither of those is 50. So I very confidently can select answer choice A. Love plugging in. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna stop here at question number five. I'm gonna go ahead and hit review section ending the math portion of the test a little early. You can see the questions I've answered. You can see the ones I've not answered. And instead of continuing to answer, because this is for demo purposes, I'm gonna end the section and submit the answers. Okay, this is gonna take me right on to the verbal section. So that is the next thing we're gonna tackle. Okay, here we go. Ready for the verbal portion. We are gonna begin the section. All right, so we've got a single blank text completion for our first question. The travel writer's blank towards others he met on his cross-country trip most likely endeared him only to those readers with the misanthropic bent. So who or what is the sentence about? It's about the travel writer something towards others he met. And whatever that thing is, endeared him only to those readers with the misanthropic bent. So misanthropy, or if you are a misanthrope, then you don't really like other people. So we know that the word that goes into that blank has to be negative. Diffidence, humility, cynicism is looking really good. It's the only one that's really truly negative in this list. Virulity, obsequiousness, gotta be that one. All right, moving on. Second one, we have a two blank sentence completion. Despite protestations to the contrary, that person had clearly blank complete sections of text from works that, while blank, were not unknown to specialists in the field who accused him of plagiarism. So I think the second blank is going to be easier here. The works, while not something, were not unknown to specialists in the field. So if these works are known by specialists, that indicates that they're probably not known by everybody. Not a common piece of knowledge. So it's got to be something like, while not well known. If we look over answer choices, prominent is not like that, uninformative, not like not well known. The closest thing we have is dated, because something dated is really old and not a lot of people would know it, besides the specialists. Feel good about that. And now that I have dated, this person is making protestations to the contrary. So they clearly something complete sections of text from works. So the specialists know these dated things, and this person is saying that he didn't do something. So the missing word has got to be something like taken or stolen these things. So that's the only thing that would really make sense with the context clues in the rest of the sentence. So if we look over at the answer choices, the closest thing we have to taken or stolen is lifted, and that makes sense. So this person clearly lifted complete sections of text from works that, while dated, were not unknown to specialists. I feel good about that. That makes sense. Moving on to the next one. Another two blank text completion. While the parasitic cascuta vine extracts substantial resources from the vegetation it preys on, it also blank chemical communication between plants linked by its snaring hooks and tendrils in a relationship that is debilitating the host in some ways, distinctly blank in others. So this begins with while. So I know this is setting up some kind of contrast. There's a shift here. It's parasitic. It extracts substantial resources, the vegetation it preys on, but because this begins with while, it must also do something good or something helpful. So if we look over at the options for the first blank, the closest thing we have to something good or something helpful is enhances. Okay, second blank. This relationship, again, we have a contrast. It's debilitating in some ways, 
and distinctly not debilitating in other ways. So it's got to be the opposite of debilitating, so helpful. It's a positive thing. And what I've got there in terms of what really clearly works for this is beneficial. I'm ready to move on to number four. Quite lengthy, three blank text completion with the blanks all in the beginning, which means that the second part of the sentence is going to be hugely helpful. Though many literary luminaries whose works appear so blank, the canon, as to make their inclusion seem blank, actually owe much to blank. Okay, I've got a colon and then a bunch of information that hopefully describes what's going on with the colon. Had Malcolm Cowley, the head editor at publishing giant Viking, not been able to wield such influence, and had he not chanced championed the works of Faulkner and Fitzgerald, both authors may have turned out to be little more than footnotes in the history of 20th century literature. So we have another contrast here. We know them as literary luminaries, or the context clues indicate that Faulkner and Fitzgerald are examples of literary luminaries. But if it were not for coincidence, or were not for this third factor, in this case Malcolm Kelly, then they might have just been footnotes. So I think the third blank is going to be easier for me to start with here, because I know it has to be something about an outside influence, a third factor factor or coincidence, and that is going to lead me to happenstance. I feel good about that. Now if I look at these other two blanks, their works appear so blank the canon as to make their inclusion seem something, but they actually owe much to happenstance. So the first part is indicating that we kind of take it for granted. These literary luminaries, they must be famous because they're so awesome and it isn't because of those other things. So we need something that indicates that they belong to the canon and we just take it for granted that they would be there. So it seems taken for granted. That works in my mind for what goes with the second blank. And the closest thing I can see to that to take something for granted is inevitable. And then now we need something to kind of align with another inevitable. Unequivocally indebted to doesn't really make sense in the context here, neither does clearly undeserving of, so I'm going to go with firmly entrenched in. That makes the most sense, and there we go. There's my answers to that three blank text completion. They can be complicated and long. All right, I could move on, but I'm going to stop now before we get into anything that is reading based, and we're just going to go ahead and hit review section. What I want to show you, here we go again, there's our answered questions and our not answered questions, but if you scroll down, when you take the free practice test, the diagnostic or the full length test. When you actually complete the full test, in section and submit answers and you'll be taken to this page which is pretty cool practice test results mine are definitely not accurate given the fact that i bailed on the test halfway through both sections no, actually a little before halfway but cool thing when you do complete these is you get to review your performance and take a deep dive into your analytics you can also continue to use free prep resources or opt for a premium account and down here you can see your results so you can look at each and every question and this is where you can get that in-depth step-by-step help for how to achieve the solution. You can check out the math questions, the ones you got right, the ones you got wrong, the category they come from, whether they're easy, medium, or difficult. All of this stuff is useful information to learn about yourself as a test taker, and you do the same thing for verbal. There you go. All right, I hope that was helpful, and I hope you take advantage of the free resources we offer here at Magoosh. And as always, happy studying.